so one, one of the big questions, questions I think that, that we often get asked, and, and <coughs> probably a lot of people would ask in this room is, you know, rooftop solar, can it, and or will it be able to sell back to the grid? So if you're putting in all that equipment, why not oversize it and you've got extra power to sell back to the grid? Okay, and the question is, why can't we do that? Why aren't we doing it? Um, now, the rooftop solar less than one megawatt in terms of the schedule two is, is, is really subject to registration or license. Um, but there's a limitation of all of these uh, embedded generation in the IOP. From a regulator's perspective, even though the Munich and ESCOM are able to provide a tariff for generating and feeding back into the grid, that approach would have certain tariff implications across the board should it be effected. So there are tariff structure and philosophy implications given the need for tariff to be cost effective and this is recognized uh, internationally. So the key is that the wise portion of the tariff and the energy portion needs to be accurately reflected and recovered to ensure that networks can be properly maintained and operated. It's also an imperative that the poor and other people that don't have the PV, uh, those customers do not subsidize those that have it. So, so that's where you've got to be very careful in how you set up this uh, uh, tariff regime. Now for us, this would be a regulatory requirement and a prerequisite for that feeding to happen. Rooftop solar installations with storage, though, um, are of greater benefit to all parties, as that would help reduce uh, maximum demand of municipalities as well as the system. But given our seminar theme about flexible generation, now I also have to ask the question, so if you have a rooftop <coughs> solar system but no storage, can that be considered flexible? Because I think in, in a lot of the stuff I've seen, PV is almost put forward as flexible. But without storage, you know, it's very difficult to say it is flexible. So the, the Electricity Regulation Act provides certain key objectives for the energy regulator to achieve. And one of the key ones for us is that we must achieve the efficient, effective, sustainable and orderly development and operation of electricity supply infrastructure in South Africa. Now the key to this is the electricity supply infrastructure, which encompasses all of the electricity system from generation through transmission to distribution. So it's not just generation. And so it's not just a simple matter of what kind of gen generation mix is or should be present, um, in my view. This electricity supply infrastructure exists to provide for the load demanded by consumers. So, so and that's where we all start. Right? What is the demand uh, and what do people need in terms of electricity supply? Um, and then the load has to be balanced with supply. <coughs> and the network frequency, I think it was mentioned earlier, has to be tightly controlled to ensure stability and quality of the electricity supply. Generation on the grid must be controllable, predictable, and reliable. Otherwise, it's chaos. So we know that some portions of load on the electricity grid never disappear. And this load has historically been supplied by what is called base load generation, as this has been the most economical and logical thing to do. Because it was cheaper, it was more reliable, it was also dispatchable, or is dispatchable. <coughs> now, in our context in South Africa, variations in load were supplied mainly by variable base load generation. So, variable, flexible, tomato, tomato, I'm not sure how you look at that. Because this was the preferred option. And this was because of economics and reliability. The other required flexibility was catered for with the pump storage, hydro, gas, which is in reality the open type of gas turbines running on diesel. Um, and the OCGTs were really only considered to be emergency generation. But as we know today, it's used pretty much as part of the system at great cost. So the historic South African generation mix, as well as the national grid, was developed for a certain low profile. I mean, I think if you even look in the, the IRP, you see these graphs that say, what is the demand? But it would be nice to say, what is the shape of the demand, and how does it change over time, and how do you most efficiently and effectively cater for that? Now, if we had a flat profile, okay, I don't think we'd even be on this topic today. Because then you just want something that will run better. Okay, but we won't go to the nuclear thing. Um, so, the, you know, the, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, I think we would agree, on our current electricity systems is profound. Um, and I was at a, a, another event the other day, we were talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and, um, you know, sometimes very hard to understand what that means. 
because the technology that we're using and all this stuff has come from before. Yeah. When I was a bit younger, a lot of this stuff was developed. But the ways we're using them now are different. And the amount of connectivity, the amount of data, all of that stuff has increased. So with all of that, I think the low profiles, the actual shape of the load globally is changing. It's not like it was before. When, when I worked at ESCOM, we knew there were these two homes in the morning and the afternoon, and the morning one was narrower and, and a bit higher, higher, and in the middle of the day it went down, and in the evening and early, late evening, early morning, it was really, very low. No, so you had a lot of excess there, but it's changed, a lot of it has changed. So we all, including me, want an electricity system that is more reliable, secure, sustainable, and efficient. But for us, the basic tenets regarding economics and predictability still need to apply, regardless of what it is that you're going to have in your mix and what type of system. Wind and solar will, will continue to increasing uh, as they have in the past. In 10 years from today, uh, they will increase by two or three times uh, in, in the deployment compared to where the uh, rate is today. Thermal capacities will, will basically decline, uh, coal, based oil, gas and so on. Flexibility is, is a bit different. We believe hydro and pumped hydro is going to eventually phase out, uh, or uh, at least a new deployment, because there will be cheaper alternatives available. Demand side management is going to uh, increase of importance, but the, the real growth is really on battery storage and peaker gas. These will not double or triple in size. They will increase by 12, 13 times compared to where they are today. Looking at these, uh, what does flexibility mean? Um, and what are the technologies to solve that? This is showing uh, the, the causes uh, and the issues utilities and dispatchers and system operators face on a daily basis on managing the, the flexibility and generation in the grid. Uh, the more renewables you have, the more issues you will have uh, to solve this. They, they have to deal with frequency regulation, they have to optimize spinning reserves, they have to look into uh, how to manage the peaks, uh, they have to look into transmission and distribution, uh, and so on. We believe the technologies, uh, there are many technologies to, to solve this issue, but we see two primary ones. Uh, Lithium-ion battery is is an emerging technology which today has uh, become the technology and we believe this is going to be the one for the future because it's so heavily driven by the electric vehicle industry that they already have a critical mass and um, uh, that's, that's just going to increase. The problem with the batteries is that you cannot fix all the flexibility issues with them because um, today they, they are basically able to uh, cover up to a couple of hours of, of storage uh, and, and shifting of solar but going beyond that it becomes too expensive because uh, you will simply have too many batteries uh, lined up to, to manage such a duration. In the future we believe the cost of batteries is going to follow a similar reducing trend in price that we have seen in PV um, but even if it would drop by 80-90% in cost you will never be able to solve 100% of your flexibility needs with batteries because you sometimes have days, weeks, months and, and even uh, seasonal variations which impacts your flexibility needs. So for this you need to have what we call flexible gas and uh, this, this will always be part of a system uh, with, with uh, lots of renewables. The power sector is undergoing uh, you know, transformation and it's driven by technological and market disruptions. Um, its power sector is moving away from fossil fuels towards renewables, which is now adding uh, more megawatts than any other technology at a, at a cheaper cost. Battery storage is being mainstream, the transport sector is undergoing electrification, and, um, and uh, the traditional centralized grid is becoming more decentralized, thereby transforming how electricity will be delivered and used. Distributed power generation, especially hybrid PV plus storage systems, smart energy, uh, efficient microgrids and off-grid lighting products are creating opportunities to reach populations that are currently unserved or underserved. Renewable energy is, is obviously what has 
driving us as a development institution uh, is also part of this. And, 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 and these changes can be significantly reduce CO2. Um, until the 1980s, uh, the power sector in most countries were vertically integrated. Uh, publicly owned utilities, owned generation, transmission, and distribution, as is the case, current model with ESCOM. In search of kind of greater efficiency and cost effectiveness, virtually integrated, the integrated utilities were privatized and unbundled into separate generation, transmission, and distribution assets, and privately owned independent power producers that could sell the electricity to the utilities were introduced. The unbundling of the power sector has led to higher investment, increased efficiency, and reduced losses, and lower electricity prices due to competitive wholesale markets. So this happened in 2000, and with governments pushing this and new technology coming onto line, and the cost of, of, of electricity came, came down, as you all know. And um, in line with that, um, we at IFC has also started looking at technology to improve um, LNG trade, which with additional capacity coming on stream, providing emerging market, market access to cost low carbon energy options, which I will talk about a bit later. So, so basically what, what has happened now is that um, the, the second phase of the disruption that, that's going to from IFC says around 2012 to 2014, uh, the, the decline of the renewable costs um, came down that it's very much the same as with parity. Um, and this is creating a kind of a, a perfect storm. Um, so today we find ourselves uh, in, in this sort of disruption where then decentralization, especially through distributed power generation, rooftop, solar PV, microgrids, off-grid lighting projects, digitalization, and the evolution of power market design is changing the market as we know this. Um, we have beyond the continuing decline of the renewable prices, the increase in adoption of uh, the competitive procurement mechanisms uh, of renewable financing, new innovations are changing this, the power landscape. But that created this change in generation flexibility, but it also does not just change the, the flexibility for generation, but also transmission uh, and distribution, flexible demand, uh, as well as flexible business models to be able to go forward. The flexibility that is now being created by all this disruption um, can have significant benefits for emerging markets, making energy cheaper, more accessible, and more reliable, and less carbon intensive. They also open opportunities for poorer countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, and also India, to leapfrog into a connected energy world. Finally, they will help displace coal in the developing world as an energy source of choice. 